Uh, welcome everyone to Grand Rounds. Hope everyone's having a good day. Um, we have actually two very uh, uh, nice presentations today um, from um, uh, two investigators, two clinicians here at, at the Yale Cancer Center. And it's my pleasure to open up with the first. Uh, that's Dr. Sarah Goldberg, who I know very well. She's part of our lung team. She's an assistant professor of medicine in medical oncology. Um, and uh, she's uh, going to speak today about a collaborative project, actually, between the lung team, or DART, and the melanoma DART, looking at brain metastases. And her, uh, her uh, title is, It's Not All in Your Head, Systemic Therapy for Lung Cancer Brain Metastases. So, Sarah. Thank you, Roy. And thank you for having me here today. It's uh, very exciting to be here to speak about um, our work on uh, brain metastases and lung cancer. Um, here's my disclosures. So by way of background, I wanted to tell you a little bit about lung cancer brain metastases. So many of you who treat lung cancer patients will already know that brain metastases are unfortunately very common in this disease. It's, they're detected in about 30% of patients with lung cancer. And standard of care for many years has been radiation therapy. So. For, for a long time, it was whole brain radiation therapy for more than a few lesions. And more recently, we've become uh, more accustomed to treating these patients with um, stereotactic radiosurgery, even for many lesions. We do sometimes um, um, opt for surgery for some patients, typically for patients with a solitary metastasis or, or, metastasis or someone who's uh, very symptomatic. Uh, but typically, radiation has been our standard of care for a, a long time for patients with brain metastases from lung cancer. So why should we even think about using systemic therapy for brain metastases in lung cancer or really any cancer? This is, this is a, a, a field that, that really is, is new and, and something that we're very interested here at Yale um, and is, is what I'm talking about today. But why should we even think about using it? We've been doing radiation and surgery in some cases for a long time. So one of the main reasons is that local therapy for brain metastases can be very toxic for patients. Surgery, I think, is, is obvious. Surgery can be very challenging for patients, especially those who have a cancer diagnosis, especially lung cancer, where patients already can have a lot of comorbidities and, and be very sick from their disease. Surgery can be challenging. But radiation can have a lot of toxicity as well. Whole brain radiation is, is well known to have immediate toxicities, nausea, fatigue, can be very challenging for patients, but even the long-term toxicities from whole brain can be difficult for patients, cognitive side effects. Many of our patients are living for a long time, and those cognitive challenges can be, can be very difficult and debilitating for patients. And, and then even with, with stereotactic radiosurgery, we do see um, uh, toxicities with that, that therapy as well, and I'm gonna show you some of that in, in a few minutes. And so toxicity is really a challenge with, with some of our local therapies. I think also an issue we're seeing more and more of is the issue of delay, the delay of systemic therapy that is required when we treat patients with local therapy can lead to complications. So in order to treat patients with local therapy, surgery especially, but including radiation, we typically delay systemic therapy. It's, it's very challenging to give both at the same time. And so we have to, we have to delay our systemic therapies in order to treat with local therapy. And that can be difficult when a patient, especially with lung cancer or other diseases, has disease in, in multiple places and, and just focusing on the brain can lead to difficulties. And, and finally, I wanted to mention this issue of radiation necrosis. So this is something I'm gonna talk about again in another few minutes, but um, radiation necrosis is something we're seeing more and more now. It's something that um, can occur with radiation on its own, but it's something we're seeing more now that we're treating patients with radiation followed by immunotherapy. And um, it's, it's an issue that, again, we're seeing more now and can, again, be very debilitating for patients, can, can lead to a lot of symptoms and, um, and, and issues in the long run for patients. So these are reasons why we might think about using systemic therapy for brain metastases. So then it comes up, well, well, why don't we just use systemic therapy for brain metastases? If there's all these issues of why, we, why, why not, well, then why haven't we just done it? I think one of the main reasons is that historically there's a very poor prognosis associated with brain metastases, especially in lung cancer. So there's some older studies looking at the prognosis in patients who have brain metastases from lung cancer, and the median survival in some of these older studies is four months. And this is a study I'm, I'm showing you here looking at patients between the 1970s and 1990s. So I'm, I chose an older study on purpose because it really does show that Again, historically, these patients just don't do well. So that's the time, four months is the time from diagnosis of brain metastases to death. And um, because of that poor prognosis, I think there's been a, a big hesitation on the part of, of pharmaceutical companies and other investigators to, to put these patients on trials and really study them 
and, and understand what's happening um, in, in the brain and, and with these patients um, on trials with, with systemic therapies. There's also an issue of the blood-brain barrier. So this is something, of course, we're all familiar with. It's, it's there for a reason, right? It's there to protect um, the brain. And, but there's an issue of getting drugs into the brain. So there's a concern that if you give a patient a systemic therapy, that it's not going to get into the brain and that there's going to be poor penetration. So if you're using a drug that's meant to get throughout the body and get wherever it needs to go to fight the cancer, if it doesn't get into the brain, it's not going to work on brain metastases, theoretically. Also, there's concern about toxicity. So if, we, if we're treating a patient with brain metastases and we're not familiar with what it might do in the brain, it could have issues that we, we don't expect, such as, for instance, seizures or, or other issues related to brain metastases that we're not familiar with. And I think a problem is that because of these concerns with treating patients with systemic therapy who have brain metastases, these patients with brain metastases have been omitted from clinical trials. And then because of that, we don't have very much data at all on patients treated with systemic therapies who have brain mats. And then this is a vicious cycle where we don't know very much about them. Then they have a poor prognosis because they're not treated well with, with these drugs. And then we have concerns about toxicities. And, and again, we, we don't know much about the drugs and there's not much, much data. So, so we really don't know much about this. And there, there actually was a recent study published just a few months ago looking at trial, clinical trials, current clinical trials, looking just at clinicaltrials.gov, very simple study, and, and trying to understand what trials are allowing patients with brain metastases on. And there's about less than a quarter of, pa of, of trials currently are allowing patients with active brain metastases on trials. So other trials are either not allowing patients with brain mats at all, this is in lung cancer, or requiring radiation prior to treatment. So we do have some data, a very little bit, really from the last couple of years on systemic therapy for brain metastases in lung cancer. And I'll just take you through a little bit of this. So there are a couple of trials of chemotherapy um, in lung cancer. I'm not going to show you the data because, again, it's really just a handful of trials, very small numbers, and um, not very, um, really not very much data to, to show you. But there are some chemotherapies that we do use in lung cancer that there have been a few patients treated on trials, and it looks like there's some activity, but it's really not very widely studied and not really very widely used clinically. The trials that we do have are mostly in targeted therapies. So why is that? It's because the targeted therapies are really where you see high response rates in lung cancer. Um, and also because there's now been a move towards developing drugs with CNS penetration in this realm, in the targeted therapy realm specifically. So this is, I think, very exciting. We're now finally, after a lot of years, starting to see drugs with CNS penetration and trials that are designed and allowing patients with brain metastases, but really just in this small niche of patients with, uh, a targeted, um, with targeted therapies with an oncogenic driver. And that makes up maybe about 15 or 20 percent of our patients with lung cancer. And so I'll just show you a couple of these trials because they really are very exciting, but again, just meant for a small percentage of our patients with lung cancer. And so this is a trial of um, electinib, which is a next generation ALK inhibitor. Let's see if I have a pointer. Yeah. Okay. So this is um, electinib, a next generation ALK inhibitor, and this is a trial with, for ALK positive lung cancer patients. About you know, four or five percent of patients with lung adenocarcinoma have this ALK rearrangement. These are patients who were treated on this trial with electinib, and the trial allowed patients with brain metastases that were not previously treated. It was not specifically a trial for patients with brain mets, but allowed it. And so you can see very small numbers here, just a couple of patients with brain metastases, but several of them with the, you know, these bars going downwards, looking at the waterfall plot here, having a nice brain metastasis response. And this is at multiple different dose levels. That's what the colors represent. And then you can see days on treatment, several of them had nice durable responses in the brain metastasis. So this drug, electinib, which is now approved for ALK positive lung cancer, does look to have good activity in the CNS. And it's something that now we're using in patients who have progression in the brain as well. So this is actually, I think, a really nice advancement, but again, in a targeted therapy realm. And then I also wanted to show you a, a relatively recent study, really just um, presented at ASCO just this last year, so, so just new emerging data of the drug osimertinib. This is a third generation EGFR inhibitor. So again, just for a small subset of our patients with lung cancer, those who have EGFR mutation positive disease. And this is not just in patients with brain metastases, but those with leptomeningeal disease, another very challenging patient population to treat. And this drug looks like it has a response rate of seven out of 21, so 33% of patients had a leptomeningeal, had response within their leptomeningeal disease. So really, I think, again, exciting uh, responses here. This is a really challenging patient population to treat, and we are seeing some really nice responses. But again, small percentages of patients are going to benefit from these drugs because it is within the targeted therapy realm. 
So now, the topic I really wanted to talk about today was immune therapy. So you've heard a lot about immune therapy and other talks in this, in this venue, and so I just wanted to briefly talk to you about immune therapy for non-small cell lung cancer. So these are two trials that shows us the benefit, the really significant benefit of immune therapy for non-small cell lung cancer. So these are two trials, one with nivolumab, the other with pembrolizumab for non-small cell lung cancer. This trial on the left is for patients with second-line squamous cell lung cancer, and this is for first-line non-small cell lung cancer, regardless of histology. And so you can see the really incredible benefit in blue. The blue line here is patients who were treated with nivolumab, the PD-1 inhibitor, compared to docetaxel, the chemotherapy, and the significant improvement in overall survival, and really a doubling of one-year overall survival in these patients. And then in the first-line setting, using pembrolizumab, this is data that was just published a few months ago, Pembrolizumab has a statistically significant improvement in overall survival compared to chemotherapy. And these two trials, along with several others, have really dramatically changed our practice in lung cancer, where these have become now standard of care in our practice, where we're treating patients pembrolizumab in first line, specifically for patients who have PD-L1 positive uh, expression, nivolumab and other PD-1, PD-L1 inhibitors in second line. Really, our practice has, has dramatically changed. The thing is that these two trials, and really every other trial of immune therapies, were only done in patients with either no brain metastases or in patients who had local therapy to brain metastases prior to enrollment. And again, that's because really every trial with immune therapy has required local therapy to brain metastases to get on the trial or has completely excluded patients with brain metastases from enrollment altogether. And so because of that, these trials have shown us the really exquisite benefit to immune therapy and other trials as well, but we really don't know the effect of immune therapy in the brain. And then I wanted to show you one other thing, this is what I alluded to earlier, which is one concern about giving immune therapy and then giving, uh, uh, giving radiation and then giving immune therapy, because that's really what the trials have required us to do for patients with brain metastases, is giving radiation or local therapy and then giving immune therapy to go on the trials, and that's now become our standard practice. And that's the issue of this. So this is, um, a, a, a case report that, that we published recently of a 59-year-old woman with lung cancer, which was metastatic to the brain, really a, a typical patient that we see all the time, and she underwent stereotactic radiosurgery to a left frontotemporal lesion followed by uh, nivolumab and ipilimumab on a clinical trial. Again, I think this is a really standard practice that we do all the time in, in lung cancer, in our lung cancer patients. And you can see here, this is um, uh, images from the, the case report that we published. This is her brain metastasis here. This is the, the images showing the really significant edema that she had. This is pretreatment. She underwent um, SRS, stereotactic radio surgery. This is one month later where she had improvement in the metastasis as well as the edema. And then she started on trial, and two months after she started on trial with immune therapy, she had what looks like growth of the metastasis increase in the size, as well as increased edema, and you can see the mass effect from that, and she was symptomatic as well. And because of that, she underwent uh, resection. What I'm not showing you here is that she actually had significant improvement in her systemic disease. She had shrinkage of her lung disease, as well as nod nodal disease, and otherwise looked like she was really benefiting. So, so what's going on here? Is she having recurrence in her brain just, um, just uh, now three months after radiation, or, or what else is happening here? And so what, what we saw when we took out the brain metastasis is what looks like radiation necrosis. So you can see, well, I'm not sure if you can see because of the way it's projecting, but she, what looks like on pathology review is necrosis, really, in, in the metastasis. There's minute collections of tumor cells, but really the majority of what's seen on pathologic review is necrosis. It does look like there's a vasculitic process here. There's hyalization of the vessel walls. There's some inflammatory cells as well. You can see CD3 positive T cells in the vessel wall, and as well as macrophages and microglial cells in the vessel wall, as well as in the brain tissue. So again, this is an entity that we, we've seen, and we've seen it more commonly and earlier, closer to the time of radiation therapy, um, which, is, which is radiation necrosis. Again, often very debilitating for patients. They can become symptomatic. And radiographically, it looks often very much like growth of the brain metastasis, and, and sometimes can be very confusing um, when we're seeing a patient like this um, clinically. So, so what is happening in the, immune, in, in the CNS, in the brain, in terms of the immune system? So this was actually, the brain was considered for a long time to be an immune privileged site where there really was not much immune activity. And we do know that it is very tightly controlled by the blood-brain barrier. But there actually is an active immune system in the brain, mainly in the form of microglial cells and macrophages from the blood. But in, in certain cases, especially in patients with brain metastases, there also are uh, T lymphocytes that can get into the brain, into the metastases. So we do know that the immune system is active in the brain. It's not as immune privileged as was once thought. 
And so because of this, we have, um, we have a lot of interest in, in using immune therapy in the brain for, for patients with, the brain, with brain metastases. And so we hypothesize that it's, if patients have brain metastases and they potentially could have benefit from immune therapy, why not use immune therapy for brain metastases as well? And so because of, of those hypotheses, we've designed a trial. And this is a trial that Harriet Kluger and I designed several years ago when pembrolizumab was really first starting to show efficacy in the systemic disease. And this is a phase two trial of pembrolizumab in patients with non-small cell lung cancer or melanoma with untreated brain metastases. The eligibility for our trial, again, lung cancer or melanoma, we required patients to have at least one untreated brain metastases that was either growing after prior radiation or had never been treated before. And we set the size limits of five millimeters to 20 millimeters for at that one brain metastasis, or they could have more. They could not have any neurologic symptoms or a steroid requirement. They had to have a good performance status of zero to one. And for the lung cancer patients, a PDL1 expression of at least 1%. And patients were treated with pembrolizumab 10 milligrams per kilogram every two weeks. We put in a very, uh, I think very important, a safety evaluation at four weeks because there was concern, and I think now several years after this trial started, rightly so, that we, we have to be very careful with these patients to make sure there's no toxicity and also no growth. And so we look, at, we look carefully early on to make sure that there's no issues early on in, in the brain. And then after that, patients uh, get um, a response evaluation every eight weeks. And then so for patients who have um, progression in the brain at their response evaluation, we do allow radiation. So it's, it's not that we're not allowing radiation, it's just that we're trying to avoid it. Um, if we can. So we do allow radiation or surgery if the brain lesions are progressing. And then otherwise, if patients are benefiting, they can continue. If they're responding in the brain and elsewhere, they, they continue on as well. Our primary endpoint is brain metastasis response rate. And we define that not by our standard resist criteria. That's the standard criteria used to evaluate um, uh, lesions in, in the body that's, that's really widely accepted for trial criteria. But we actually slightly modified resist criteria to make it um, make it useful for brain metastases. And we did that by allowing up to five target lesions in the brain, and we set the limit slightly lower. So standard resist allows a diameter of, of one centimeter, and we lowered it slightly for brain metastases to five millimeters. And these are our secondary endpoints, looking at other clinical endpoints, as well as a, a host of exploratory endpoints using tissue and blood. And so I'm gonna show you data from an interim analysis that, that we have um, recently uh, published last year. So this is the baseline characteristics of patients with lung cancer. We also publish patients with uh, melanoma. I'm not gonna show you that here, although I will show you a little bit of data from our melanoma patients. So we looked at the first 18 patients enrolled on our trial with non-small cell lung cancer. Median age was 59, typical for our lung cancer patients, so, uh, slightly more women than men in the trial. All of them had a good performance status as set by our eligibility. Most patients had adenocarcinoma. We did see one patient with EGFR mutation and one with an ALK rearrangement. Again, as by design for our eligibility, they all had PDL1 expression. Uh, there were some patients who had no prior systemic therapy, so this was their first line of therapy, but most of them did have prior systemic therapies, and some of them had several, so some of them were very heavily pretreated. And I think importantly is important is to look at their prior CNS therapy. So some of them had had no prior CNS therapy, but many of them had. So some of them had resection of, of a lesion. And then several of them had had whole brain radiation. So six of them had whole brain radiation. And five patients had stereotactic radiosurgery. So these are patients who had radiation to their brain in the past and had failed, which is actually an important patient population to think about because these patients are, in often cases, are running out of options for treatment of their brain lesions and, and really are in need of other, other things. And so again, as by the trial uh, eligibility, they had to have had at least one lesion that was growing to follow, but they could have had radiation in the past. And these are our results that we saw. So out of the first 18 patients, we had six patients who had a brain metastasis response for a response rate of 33%. And then the same in the, in the systemic disease. Six patients also had a systemic response, again, 33% response rate. So both response rates were 33%. But they actually weren't exactly the same patients who had a brain and a systemic response. Most of them were, though. All but one patient had a concordant response. There was one patient who responded in the body, but not in the brain. But it was an interesting story because she actually did respond in the brain transiently, and then she had progression in her brain. And then so we radiated her brain metastases because they were growing, and she was able to continue on trial for a long time after. At the time of this data cutoff, 10 months later, she was continuing to have a great response in the body and remained on trial. And actually, she, she stayed on trial for many more months after that, doing very well. And then I think also incredibly important is the duration of response. 
So brain metastasis response as well as systemic response was ongoing in four of the five confirmed responders at the time of the data analysis. So, so many of these responses were durable. This is our waterfall plot, and this is showing you not just lung cancer patients, but also melanoma. And so you can see on the far right here, these are four patients who had a complete brain metastasis response who have uh, lung cancer. That's uh, as noted by these crosses here. And so again, 100% um, response in, in their brain metastasis, really complete disappearance of brain metastases um, from baseline. So very exciting to see that. And many other patients with both lung cancer and melanoma having, having a, a fantastic response in their brain. Unfortunately, you can see many patients not responding in their brain, having a, a lot of growth, and these patients then went on often to have local therapy when indicated. This is looking at a swimmer's plot, looking at duration of response on trial, again, looking at melanoma patients as well as lung cancer patients. This is looking at both the responders as well as patients who were on trial for more than six months. And so these are you know, similar patients, as you, same patients as you just saw in the waterfall plot. So again, the green is the patients who had the, the complete response, and, and these patients were on trial for, at the time of data cutoff, several months. But many of these actually stayed on trial for many, many more months. This data is now, now, is now somewhat, a somewhat older data because it's been many months since we did our data cut point. But some of these patients have stayed on for many more months after this and, and are still continuing to do incredibly well with complete responses in the brain and, and doing very well systemically as well. So really a durable benefit in the brain and the body. I just wanted to show you a couple of examples of, our, of some of our really fantastic brain metastasis responses. So the top uh, uh, MRIs are, are from a patient of mine who's a 51-year-old woman. She has lung adenocarcinoma diagnosed with metastatic disease. She was previously treated with, radio, oh, with um, uh, SRS to several brain metastases. She had chemotherapy, and then she had progression with several new lesions. She went on our trial with pembrolizumab, and she had a, a complete response in her brain and a partial response in her body. And you can see that there. I couldn't even put arrows in the second, oops, in the second picture because uh, there was really nothing to show you. She really had a complete response here. And at the time of data cut point, she, um, her response was ongoing at seven plus months, but she's gone on you know, more than a year later now at this point and, and doing really well. And so on the bottom here is another patient, a 69-year-old woman also with metastatic lung adenocarcinoma. She had had prior whole brain radiation and chemotherapy and then developed multiple new brain metastases. She went on our trial with Pembro. Again, she had a really nice response, not a complete response here. You could still see a little bit of a, a lesion here. Also had a nice systemic response that lasted 10 months. So even after prior whole brain radiation, which often these patients have very limited local options in the brain, she had a nice response with pembrolizumab. And that, this is a very early data because uh, the follow-up is, is very short here, but I just wanted to show you the survival, which is a median of 7.7 .7 months. Unfortunately, many patients who don't respond to the drug still do poorly because brain metastases are, unfortunately, a poor prognostic sign in patients who don't respond to therapy. But many patients who, as I just showed you, do respond and do well with therapy do tend to, to have a long survival and are doing very well on, on the trial. And then, of course, toxicity. So what do we know now about toxicity after our first 18 patients? And now we have actually many more on trial that I'm not showing you here, but data look very similar from what we've seen. Actually, the, the, um, looking at treatment-related adverse events looks very similar to what we see with pembrolizumab in other trials that don't include patients with brain metastases or do require radiation. So the um, toxicity looks very similar, what we expect with, with um, immune therapy. We specifically wanted to look at neurologic adverse events to, to make sure we weren't seeing anything of concern. So this is looking not just at treatment-related adverse events, but all adverse events, regardless of treatment attribution. And for the lung cancer patients, we really only saw uh, grade one events. So grade one headache, dizziness, cognitive dysfunction, and stroke. So really mild adverse events um, that may or may not even have been attributed to drug. So overall, very tolerable uh, drug for these patients. So you know, I mentioned earlier that we use this modification of resist criteria to measure the response in the brain. I think this is actually a really important point in our trial because you might say, well, these patients did well, but you were using, you know, you were looking at these really small lesions, so maybe they would have done well anyway. So, so what do we know about that? We, you know, we, we actually modified it on our own because there was really no, nothing available at the time to tell us what we should be doing. And that's what I'm saying here. So there's no standardized criteria for measuring response of brain metastasis to systemic therapy. It really, at the time we wrote this trial, it just didn't exist. So again, we modified the resist criteria to allow lesions of five millimeters and to allow five or more target lesions. Since then, there was a consensus group that published this Reno brain metastasis criteria. And it's different than what we did, unfortunately. So this is the differences, just to highlight a, a couple. But really, the most important difference is this um, criteria of 
the size of the lesion. So in our criteria, this is our criteria that we, we, we uh, used for the trial, we allowed five millimeters or more um, uh, of size for brain metastasis. Whereas standard resist is 10 millimeters, this other criteria I'm not going to really talk about is, is 10 millimeters, and then this is now, I think, considered to be, you know, the, this consensus group came out with this paper, this I think is now, I think, probably going to start to be the standard is 10 millimeters as well. So what does that do? Well, we recently put together our experience with this, and, and um, uh, one of the medical students here at Yale really uh, led, led, this, led our group here in, in putting this data together, and fortunately was just accepted for publication, so this is very exciting. And, um, he, and we wanted to know, well, how does our criteria stand up to, to um, the other criteria? And so he really found that the response rate looking at our criteria from the trial, this is again looking at our trial that we, I just showed you the data from, the tri this is looking at melanoma and lung together, so the numbers are a little different, but our data look very similar whether you use our criteria or the other criteria. A little, slightly differences in terms of response, slight differences in terms of response rate, but overall very similar. The main difference that you can see is that the ineligibility rate. So in patients, it, it, when you use the lower criteria for, for um, allowing patients on trial, the five millimeter threshold that we had used for the trial, we were able to get 13 more patients on trial compared to standard resist and 19 more patients compared to this other criteria, Reno HGG. So we were able to get many more patients on by allowing this smaller brain metastasis size, and it really did not change the, the response rate. It really did not change the outcome, but we were able to get so many more patients on. And many of those patients who were allowed on our trial that wouldn't have been allowed on if we used the standard criteria had really great responses and durable benefit. So let me just conclude here, and then I will wrap up. So using systemic therapy, I think, should be a tool for medical oncologists to consider in treating patients with lung cancer and brain metastasis. I showed you our data with pembrolizumab, but also chemotherapy could be an option, and I think especially targeted therapy as well. I showed you some of that data early on. The data I did show you mostly was about our trial with pembrolizumab, which does appear to have activity in the brain in patients with untreated brain metastases from lung cancer. Of the six patients who had a response, five a systemic response, five of them also had response in the brain, and those responses were durable. Patients did very well for a long time, and treatment does appear to be very well tolerated. So I would conclude that pembrolizumab for select patients with small and asymptomatic brain metastasis may be an alternative to radiation. I think also using a lower threshold for target brain metastases for trials could, uh, could facilitate accrual, so using this five millimeter cutoff. And even though there were differences in these criteria, I think using this smaller cutoff could really help with accrual and good concordance was seen. So of course there are still many questions that remain. Hopefully we've started to answer some of them, but there are many questions. So how can we predict who will benefit? So I showed you that waterfall plot when many patients benefited, but many did not. So we have uh, fortunately collected blood and tumor tissue from patients on the trial, and now we are starting to work on analyzing that. So hopefully we will be able to uh, start to predict who will benefit from this drug. Um, both systemically, which that, that, those studies are ongoing at, at many centers, but you know, there may be something different about patients with brain metastases, and that's something we're looking at. And I think especially in patients with disease in the brain, predicting who's going to benefit is, is really even more important otherwise, than, than otherwise because you really don't want those patients to pro progress in the brain if you can help it. So can we improve the response rates or maybe even decrease toxicity? And so, again, pembrolizumab does have have uh, a good response rate associated with it even in the brain, but can we improve it? So uh, Harriet Kluger and I recently um, opened a trial of pembrolizumab with bevacizumab. So this is a combination that's been studied using a VEGF inhibitor with an immune therapy um, and looks to have promise in systemic disease. But again, just like many other trials or most other trials, we don't know about its activity in the brain. And there's some reason to think that using bevacizumab in brain metastases may be beneficial both to improve response rates and potentially to improve toxicity. So there's, in, in terms of edema in the brain, which we often will see, there's, there's a, a potential that bevacizumab could improve edema, so potentially combining the drugs may actually improve that. So that's something that we recently opened and, and we're really excited to, uh, to accrue to and see the data from that as well. And so I think maybe this is a, one of the more important questions. Is this ready for prime time? So I showed you data on 18 patients, not very many patients. So. I would say maybe. So we, we aren't going to get any, you know, except for our trial, which now we've accrued more patients and, and hopefully we'll be uh, uh, publishing the rest of our, our cohort soon. We, there's really no other trials that I know of that's going to have any more data anytime soon. So I would say that in carefully selected patients, we may be able to use this 
I think ideally we would have a randomized trial to confirm findings, but I'm not sure that's coming anytime soon. So potentially this could be ready for prime time in very carefully selected patients that are closely monitored. So of course there's many people to acknowledge. There's so many people that um, helped with this trial and many of the other studies. Roy has been my mentor for since I've been here, and Harriet as well. I didn't know that I would have a melanoma mentor when I started here at Yale, but she's been really an incredible mentor with this trial and other things. Um, the rest of the lung team has been incredible. We have really a wonderful group, and, and many others. Veronica Chang from neurosurgery was such a key part of this trial. So thank you so much to everyone for listening. Uh, thanks, uh, Sarah, we have time for a couple of questions. Uh, Dr. Sklar. Do you have any sense that prior radiation potentiates the effect of uh, immune checkpoint inhibitors by, for instance, inducing mutation? Right. Difficult th question to answer maybe, but if you look at patients who had received distant radiation, mm -hmm. do they do somewhat better right. because of this effect? Right, so um, I'm not sure if you mean in our trial or in general. In general or yeah. in trial. Yeah. So, so it, there, right. So there's there's a, a this, this thought that there's this upscopal effect if you get radiation in one site and you can have benefit in other sites potentially from release of antigen and 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 um, enhancement of the immune response. So there has definitely been case reports and anecdotal reports of patients who will get radiation at one site and then have shrinkage of disease at other sites on immune checkpoint inhibitors. Um, and so there are trials that are looking at this. So Roy Decker here has a trial of of looking at radiation at the time of disease progression on immune therapy and radiation to one site and looking at other sites. So that's being looked at. I'm not sure that this is something that, that will pan out in a trial. In terms of our trial, we did look at whether patients who had prior radiation seemed to be the ones who benefited from this. And it didn't really seem to, 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 to look that way. So it didn't seem that the patients who had prior radiation were the ones who had the benefit or not. I would not anticipate I see what you mean. Right, so we, we looked at that as well. So it, didn't, it actually didn't look like any of the patients who had shrinkage of their target lesions had had prior radiation to that target lesion. So at least from our patients in both lung and melanoma, which was 18 and 18, it didn't look like that from the small numbers we've seen in the brain. Okay, last question, Steve. Sarah, <clears throat> Sarah this has uh, been a very fascinating story to follow. Um, and I think you guys have, guys have done a great job. When you give the, the Pembro to these patients with a CNS, do, do they get ongoing administration of this drug over months, or, or is it a limited thing? So the way we designed the trial was two years of, of treatment. Right. So I, I'm wondering, uh, you know, I was taught, and I, I don't follow this obviously, but I was taught that when people have active uh, brain tumors, and Skip Grossman and Hopkins did a lot of this, uh, you know, the blood-brain barrier is open. You can see that with MRI, with yeah. gadolinium and stuff. And that as you, as they heal, blood-brain barrier potentially, uh, you know, is back intact. So I'm just wondering, it's kind of interesting to know whether, whether what you're giving down the road is really getting in there at all. At all. This is one thought I had. And, uh, you know... Well, I was just, just to say, but to comment on that, so the patients we've had on that have been, the patients that we've had that have been on for several, I, I showed data that, you know, up to a year or, or so, but the patients we've had on longer than that now, which, I, again, I didn't show because we don't have the complete right. set, but we have a, some experience now with up to two years in patients. The patients who've had good responses, even with complete responses in the brain, continue to have that at two years. Right, so, but, but that may be from the original that's administration. Right. Of that's right. You're so right. the other question that's I, right. I Do they still had, need it, I guess, is whether, the question. We don't yeah, know. I don't know. We don't know. <laughs> and I'm wondering whether there's any way, whether you talk to your Kurt Schalper and those people, about whether uh, uh, one could look for interesting immune reactive cells in the lumbar punctures. Uh, there's something to think about. I mean, it would be yeah. fascinating to track that. Yeah, so I agree. I think you know, we're going to be looking at tissue from well, all patients were required to have tissue to go on trial. But from the lung cancer patients, we really rarely get brain tissue, we're brain metastasis right. tissue. We had talked about whether to get CSF, but it, it's also very hard to mandate that in a trial. It, it would be very interesting. The melanoma patients, many of them do have brain metastasis tissue because more commonly they have resections and things. So that is something I think that will be really interesting to look at, but not in the, unfortunately not in the lung patients, but it's a great thought. Okay, thanks, Sarah. Thank you.
So that was, that was very nice. Not only is that an investigator-initiated trial you know, with uh, samples and correlative science that can be part of grants and spores, but I believe those data were also used when a former president had brain metastases and needed to get the drug. So for those of us that are clinicians here, we we'll often get the call, I want what the president had. And it's nice to know that the innovation was from here. Okay, the, the next uh, speaker um, is uh, our chief of the um, otolaryngology, uh, the clinical program leader of the head and neck uh, program uh, at Smilo. That's Wendell Yarborough. And he's going to talk to us today about demethylation therapy for HPV positive head and neck squamous cell carcinoma. Uh, Dell. Thanks. Thanks, Roy. Um, Usually after I follow a lung cancer talk, I say we just move on up to the head and neck, a little higher plane, but uh, Sarah outdid me and went to the brain, so I don't know what to say now, right? Uh, <laughs> but this is, a, this is a study that really came from um, a um, T-tier um, trial. Oh, yeah, Steve, thanks. And, and grew out of there. So um, I just want to talk a little bit about demethylation therapy for um, HPV positive head and neck cancer. I put a question there because uh, demethylation therapy really hasn't been used too much for head and neck cancer in the past. I don't have any disclosures. And like I said, this grew out of a, a project that was funded by the TTAIR and, and ended in a trial, which I'll talk about at the end. So just for people who aren't aware, HPV associated head and neck cancer is an epidemic now. It's, it's been exponentially increasing. It's different than tobacco associated disease in lots of different ways, including survival, demographic differences and molecular differences. And I just showed this slide because this is all the 2016 HPV associated tumors in the United States. And I show this because now head and neck cancer is the number one most common HPV associated cancer in the United States. So if you think uterine cervical cancer is a big deal and deserves funding and deserves attention and prevention, then head and neck cancer also deserves uh, just as much. And there's more HPV associated head and neck cancer than all other causes of HPV associated cancer except for cervix when you add them together. All right, so um, the survival differences, just in case you didn't believe me, this is a study that basically shows survival differences. I'm going to switch sides here because I'm turning away. Um, shows survival differences between HPV positive and negative, so it's a big difference in survival with HPV positive surviving much better. And because of that, we've been looking to de-escalate therapy. These people are getting cancers when they're younger and um, giving them chemotherapy and radiation to pretty high doses like we do leaves them with lifelong morbidity. So we're looking at lots of different ways to decrease their chemotherapy or radiation doses, to use transoral robotic surgery for um, therapy and try to avoid, avoid chemotherapy and radiation altogether. But to date, there's really no molecular markers that have been used to define which patients are better for de-escalation. And to date, there's really no novel de-escalation escalation agents that are approved. So with TCGA data came out, coming out, we uh, mined that to look for differences and basically saw some differences in methylation status between HPV positive um, cancers and tobacco associated cancers with more global methylation noted in HPV positive tumors. And that's just what's shown here. The HPV positive tumors have all this blue, which is more methylation compared to HPV negatives. So because of this methylation, we thought demethylation may be a good therapy. So um, we looked at the drug 5-azacitidine. I don't have to tell this group probably what that does. It in integrates into the DNA and then it traps DNA methyltransferases to the DNA so that they're inactive and it results in global hypomethylation. So the initial responses that we saw in cell lines were pretty good. So you can see these are cell lines and, a, and two primary cell cultures from patients. This is a log scale, so this response to 5-azacitidine is pretty nice um, in HPV positives compared to HPV negatives. And so with this response, we wanted to explore what could be a mechanism for the response. And double-strand breaks obviously cause a response um, and cell death, so we looked for double-strand breaks following methylation, demethylation therapy. And you can see at different time points, up to 72 hours in HPV-positive tumors, 
Um, at 24 and 48 hours, we really don't see much. This band represents the double strand breaks and everything below that. This is the band that's still in the well of intact DNA. And so you can see that at 72 hours in uh, two different cell lines, we start seeing double strand breaks. In HPV negative tumors and most other tumors that we've tested, including uterine cervical cancer, we do not see double strand breaks after 5-azocytidine therapy, regardless of what the cell type is. So what, what's um, sensitizing these uh, patients to 5-azocytidine? We did a couple of things. Um, um, double strand breaks are associated with transcription and translation frequently. And we did find that the double strand breaks here are associated with transcription and translation in these cells. Um, but we also wanted to look for molecules that are bound to chromatin or that may be directly responsible for creating the double strand break. So we look for chromatin bound proteins um, after treatment with 5-azocytidine compared to untreated cells. And we ended up with 157 proteins um, by mass spec. And one of them was Apobec 3B that caught our eye. And the reason it caught our eye is because Apobec 3B is a virally responsive um, gene. And um, it, uh, it's, eight, in fact, 3B is the one that responds to HPV infections. And it's thought to be a mutagen. So the idea is a virus infects your cells, this thing gets upregulated, and it mutates the viral DNA so that the virus can't work as well. In HIV, it's other, other types of Apobec, but in HPV, it's Apobec 3B. So we saw upregulation of Apobec 3B, and we wanted to explore that a little bit more. Um, in cancers, Apobec expression in general varies across cancers, but you can see head, neck, and, and lung are up there amongst the highest in apobec expression. Um, and because of this, we started working with Karen Anderson some and have some projects ongoing um, with her um, to look at that. She's looking in lung already and now is expanding her studies to head and neck um, to some degree too. The apobec has also been associated with mutations in these tumors. And if you look at the mutation signature for apobec, you can see head and neck's also in the higher echelon of apobec-related mutations. So when we um, looked at more specifically at head and neck cancer, what you can see is that the HPV-positive cohort's probably driving this apobec signature that we're seeing because 25% of these tumors that are HPV-positive have overexpression of apobec and Apobec 3B, and then you can see the other Apobecs. And so A Apobec is a cytidine D um, amylase, and um, basically it um, mutates uh, cytidine to uracil. Um, and then UNG is, is a, a, a glycosylase that basically creates a single strand break in those situations. So UNG is also expressed in many of the tumors with Apobec expression. This is compared to HPV negative uh, tumors where you see only 2.9% expression and 2.1% expression. So they're quite different tumors. And I showed this because this quantifies what you saw previously, but it, we also included cervical cancer on this one. And the reason I show that is because cervical cancer doesn't do this. And that's something that I'll come back to later is why does cervical cancer not have the same increase in apobec 3b. We all know cervical cancer is caused by HPV, so what's the difference? Um, so in addition to be, being overexpressed in untreated tumors from TCGA, we found that if we treated cell lines with 5-azocytidine, um, apobec 3b expression increased further. So we, we even saw a, a, a more increase as opposed to HPV negative cells where 5-azocytidine did not increase um, those levels at all. Um, so what's 5-azocytidine um, doing in these cells? Um, and we explored a lot of things, um, including activation of P53. So P53 is downregulated by HPV proteins in HPV-positive head and neck cancer. And using a reporter assay, what we saw was that in HPV-positive head and neck cancer cell lines treatment with 5-azocytidine, increased p53 transcriptional um, activity in hpv negatives we did not see the increase and if we knock down p53 in the cells we saw that knockdown of p53 basically protected the cells from 5-azocytidine induced cell death 
Um, and this is just showing that the 5-Azacitidine um, activity did increase P53. When we knock down P53, there's no increase. This increase in P53 was associated with cleave PARP or apoptosis. And it, this just shows that the um, free fraction of uh, DNA methyltransferase was um, decreased being trapped on the chromatin, so 5-Azacitidine was basically working. So part of the um, mechanism through which 5-Azacitidine is in inhibiting these cells' growth and killing them is probably through P53. We also uh, wanted to explore other um, mechanisms, and we saw that 5-Azacitidine downregulated all HPV genes, and this is showing E6 and E7, which most people are interested in, and this is fold decrease. Um, the red cells have been treated with um, standard cytotoxic chemotherapies or, or radiation mimetics, so they're not decreased, but in, in all of the um, uh, tumors tested, you can see that um, HPV genes are decreased. And we know what E6 and E7 decrease will do, and this is consistent with P53 being upregulated. Um, in those cells, but we don't know what decrease of the other HPV genes may do, and it may have some effect as well. Um, so when we uh, inhibit apobec 3 b by CRISPR, we wanted to see if this protected from double strand breaks and from death, and you can see in the CRISPR cells, you see fewer double strand breaks after 5-azacytidine treatment compared to untreated cells. And if you look at cell survival, the, Ap the Apobec CRISPR cells survive much better after 5-Azacitidine compared to the control cells. And this is, once again, a log scale. So that's pretty good protection of these cells. So Apobec 3B seems to be a key driver of the cytotoxicity as well as the double strand breaks. So we, we then started doing some more preclinical studies because we wanted to initiate a clinical trial, and we eventually did that, and Harry Despande is the PI of the clinical trial um, that's ongoing um, right now. But um, looking at mice, you can see for two different cell lines, treatment with 5-Azacitidine basically had a tumor growth inhibition effect. And if we look at the tumors at the time of excision, um, this was about three days after the last dose of 5-Azacitidine. This was the day at, uh, at the time of the last dose of 5-Azacitidine. You can see a decrease in KI67 staining for both tumors, so it's inhibiting their proliferation. Um, more, um, more to the point, these are from um, patient samples that um, are on the clinical trial. So these are the first five patients that got enrolled into the clinical trial. And we've analyze their tumor. We got tumor tissue before and after a five or seven day treatment of 5-azacitidine. And so this is just comparing uh, the fold change in the before versus the after uh, treatment um, in expression of a few of the HPV genes. And I don't show them all here, but they all were decreased. But I show E6 and E7. And you can see some of these tumors markedly decreased E6 and E7, um, you know, this, this tumor in particular really killed all of their E6 and E7, but most of them uh, significantly decreased. And this was associated with P53 protein stabilization or increased P53 protein level. And you can just see the before and after and all the red tumors, which are the HPV positive tumors, P53 is increased in every one. And if you look at the quantification, it's more than tenfold increased in most tumors. So P53 is probably playing a big role here as well. So clinical studies, um, once again, um, we, we looked at caspase activity in these same tumors that I described earlier, and you can see caspase activity, this is ELISA-based caspase activity uh, assay, is increased in every tumor. This is the HPV negative tumor that's not increased. And this one tumor did not have an increase in uh, caspase activity, but the remainder did, and they were all significant. So we think there may be cell death associated with this treatment. So this gets to a little bigger uh, question for us, and I mentioned this earlier when I, when I showed that um, there was differences between um, HPV-positive tumors and uterine cervical cancer. If you really start looking at the, the differences, there's lots of differences. I think this one is the one I want to focus on a little bit. That in uterine cervical cancer, 
the progression from early CIN to advanced CIN is associated with HPV integration. It's not true in the head and neck. In, in head and neck cancer, we don't know early versus late. There's no precursor um, lesion. But HPV is not integrated in about 30% of the tumors. And I'll talk a little bit about this, but there's no mutations in TRAF or CYLD in uterine cervical cancer, but there is in about 30 to 40 percent of HPV positive head and neck cancers, which is remarkably close to this level of uh, integrated, um, not integrated tumors. E2 is lost in uterine cervical cancer, and E6 and E7 are upregulated because of that loss. But in HPV positive cancer, all HPV genes are expressed in 70 percent of the tumors. Survival for advanced stage is not very good in uterine cervical cancer, 35 percent, but in head and neck cancer, it's 75 percent. So once again, a big difference in the treatment, similar with the cytotoxic agent, uh, platin agent plus radiation. And APOBEC 3B is really only um, increased in 4% of these tumors versus 25% of these tumors. And this just shows L1 expression in all these HPV positive tumors from the head and neck that you don't see in uterine cervical cancer. So this, um, I think, um, one thing that relates to these differences between uterine cervical cancer and head and neck cancer is a whole nother talk, but I'm just going to touch on it here. Um, is basically carcinogenesis of HPV, we think, differs in the head and neck versus uterine cervix. So what this is, is this is a head and neck cancer cell line that we can take the media from. We do uh, density ultracentrifugation and we collect fractions, and you can see in certain ones of these fractions there is um, HPV DNA. This is just PCR with two different um, primer sets to show the HPV DNA and L1, which is the major capsid protein of HPV. So you can see L1 in fractions 8 and 9 primarily along with HPV DNA. So when we expose HPV negative cells, SCC61, to this fraction or all of these fractions, Basically, you can see expression of HPV genes in these HPV negative cells that are exposed to these fractions of um, media. And so what's this suggesting is there's something transferring HPV genes to be expressed in HPV negative cells from these HPV positive cells. And if we do EM on these fractions, you can see these particle-like um, um, yeah, <laughs> particle-like uh, substances that are in, the, in there. And so we think these may represent some form of a particle that's transferring HPV genes. I don't know if it's a virus. We don't, we don't really know what it is, but we do know L1's there. We know HPV DNA's there, and we know these things look like this. So methylation is different in tumors with and without integration. So we think the tumors that have the episomal forms may be the ones that make this um, substance that can transfer genes. Um, and if you look at HPV integration positive versus HP integration negative, you see the more methylated in general um, subset are the, uh, the non-integrated tumors. Um, and this just shows it um, in a graph form. So methylation is, seems to be higher in non-integrated forms. And recently, we looked at two genes that are mutated only in HPV positive cancer, not in uterine cervical cancer, and not in HPV negative cancer. And these two genes uh, are, were interesting to us because they, they're, what they do basically is they activate the innate immune response to viruses. And so TRAF3 and CYLD, um, if, if cells get infected by a virus, will activate innate immune response and the cell will kill itself, basically. So these are inactivating mutations that are seen in HPV positive cancers. And what we can see is that the tumors that have um, mutated TRAF and CYLD have less smoking. Um, but really the interesting part I think is the integration or lack of integration or both integrated and unintegrated forms primarily occur in the mutant form of TRAF, uh, on the mutant tumors, TRAF CYLD mutants. So what I think what this is saying is tumors that mutate TRAF CYLD may be getting continuously exposed to some HPV genomes and it, to prevent them from killing themselves with the innate immune response, they have to inactivate these proteins. And here's the survival. So basically the mutant proteins, uh, the, the tumors with mutant TRAF or CYLD have improved survival compared to the 
the tumors with wild type TRAF, CYLD, and these are also the ones that have integration. So it seems like integration is a bad thing, epizomal is a good thing for survival, and this can be marked by these mutations. So in conclusion, um, HPV positive cancer is different than HPV negative cancer and kind of remarkably different than uterine cervical cancer. Demethylation of HPV positive cancer causes P53 stabilization, downregulation of HPV genes, apobec 3 b expression, double strand breaks, and proliferative rest, tumor growth inhibition, and apoptosis. 5-ASA effects uh, in uh, HPV positive cancer relate to a new mechanism of HPV carcinogenesis. I think these probably are related. We don't know exactly how. And uh, demethylation is now being explored, explored for therapy. And these are the people who did, did the work. Um, you know, uh, a great medical student, Michael Hayek, um, who's going into ENT, which is a wise choice for students if you're thinking about it, uh, <laughs> uh, did a lot of this work along with Nataya uh, IC. Even, of course, the rest of the team uh, contributed greatly as well. Uh, the clinical team ran the trial, mentioned that Harry's the PI for the uh, 5 a cytidine trial, um, but all of the trial samples came from the uh, clinical team. Nice. Uh, questions from anyone? Dr. Gore, you always have a question. <laughs> well, azacytidine is very near and dear to my heart. Uh, so, well, it is. Um, so, um, are you, um, Del, are you looking at um, specific loci or, uh, or methylomics in the post-treatment samples? I mean, the, the, the bugaboo with uh, azonucleosides uh, you know, is that uh, at higher doses, they're definitely DNA damaging agents. And uh, it's hard to titrate them down to, uh, to levels uh, where they are not so. Um, and we don't know completely whether that's due to DNA methyltransferase inhibition or to the fact of the add-on. So just wondering what your thoughts are. Um, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, that's I mean, really the question, what are you doing here? Yeah, that's right. Um, yeah, I mean, it's an interesting question. Um, we do think that the mechanism is a little bit different than just causing DNA damage in some global type of way. And when we, we can uh, treat cells in lab with extremely low doses of 5 a cytidine, and in fact, the mice that got treated here got treated with about one fifth of the dose that's normally used to treat mice for myeloproliferative and other things. So we can treat cells and mice with extremely low doses and get a response. And we don't see double strand breaks. We, there's DNA damage probably, but if we look for double strand breaks, we don't see those double strand breaks in any other cells except for HPV positive head and neck cancer. So we think the mechanism is probably different. And I bet we, and, and the, the response we're seeing in, in patients, I think suggests that maybe a lower dose will do the job in head and neck cancer. Dell Public Health question, what's your recommendation on the vaccine? <laughs> Give, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, the vaccination rate, as you know, in Connecticut is not great. Um, it's really bad for boys. Um, so obviously any, any males 21 or, or younger and females 26 and younger should get vaccinated. It, it should protect against close to 100% of head and neck cancers, which everyone in the room now knows is the major HPV problem in the United States. Um, and so get vaccinated. Okay, you heard it from our chief here. Okay, well, thank you all. We'll see you next week.